actually started I, st I started a venture to help Nigerians move to Canada for, for PR, to help Nigerians apply for PR by themselves. So I created a website after going through the process myself. I created a website, recorded videos, and published it to help Nigerians move to Canada um, without you know applying through like expensive immigration consultants. And so I put that on the CV and that actually came up on my on my interview and everyone were, everyone was surprised by it. They were like, oh my goodness, you're, you're doing this great thing. And for me, it was just like, you know, just trying to help people uh, move to, to to Canada. And so just to go, go to say again, just sell yourself. You never know what might might be amazing. So something that might be small to you might be super amazing to, to other people. Um, and then also in terms of, I also added a few scholarly activities that I did. Again, this wasn't on my CV last, my last application, but based on feedback and based on the, the CVs that I saw, I added this. And this section was really to just highlight the fact that you're continuing to stay active clinically and you're continuing to stay active in your in your specialty, your focus. And so things that I added were attending the morning rounds at U of T because they, I reached out to them and they had a, because of COVID, they're doing their morning rounds via Zoom. So they sent their Zoom link to me. So every morning at 7 a.m. before work, I would log on um, and just be there. My mic is muted the whole time, but I, I'm there. And in the interview, when I entered the room, they're like, oh, we know you know all about the program because we see that you're attending our morning rounds every day. You know, so that's that's something that you could do. Um, I also attended, there's, there was a medical education course that organized also by U of T, which just concluded for orthopedic surgery. I attended that as well. Um, I attended the annual general meetings for the Ontario Orthopedic Association. I put that on my CV as well. Um, and I also attended um, academic days at different other institutions. It's, it's, COVID was a damper on so many things, but it also gives you the opportunity to participate in virtual, virtual events and virtual conferences and virtual uh, research projects even that you probably wouldn't have had access to prior. Lastly, added I also added interests, sports, music, tech enthusiasts, and um, just entertainment in general because some of those things um, is what would separate you from the rest of the crowd and it would be good interview icebreakers and things like that. Wow, I don't know if anyone else agrees, but you know, this was loaded, right? Very loaded. And um, you see, so all of those things Olumide has reeled out that seem like normal mundane things, right? One thing I hear very clearly is you were intentional. You knew that this is the specialty and then you started chasing everything to add on regarding that specialty. So you looked, U of T is not the only school in Ontario, right? I want to imagine that you, looked at all the different schools that offer also for IMGs, and then you emailed all of them. You know, so in this quest, you're going to email several people. So if you email 100 people, you may get one response, and that is okay. Sometimes that one is all you need. So I'll bring in my personal experience here. So I have an ob background. So coming here, I initially thought, oh, okay, maybe I'll do ob you know, let's see. So I looked at the slots, there were really few. And then I looked at how many years I'd been out of graduation and some, the programs were quite specific, maybe if you're more than three years or something. So I reside in Calgary. So I went into the U of C site, you know, and I emailed every ob staff in U of C. And what was I asking for? Observership two people responded to me. One was the head of department and one was a lady. And the head of department said, you know, I'm so sorry, but at this time, because of the traffic, they had midwives, they had nursing students, they had residents, and then they had residents from outside the country who come for electives. They can't entertain me to be in the OR and on the pad. And then the other lady, so imagine this is like almost 30 people that I emailed. And then the other lady responded and said, even if you can't do clinical, I'm open to us doing, I'm working on an IUGR project, research project. Will you be game to come on it? But it's not paid. I said, sure. 
and I wrote that paper with this woman. And every year they do their academic week day in the department where there's no lecture, there's no clinic, nothing. And it's all presentations from morning till evening. And I happened to present this paper that year. The woman said, go on as the lead author and present, you know? And this I put in when I was putting my application together, you know? So I made up my mind later that, okay, I'm not gonna apply for ob but how do I bring that previous experience? So I said, I want to do family medicine with a special interest in women's health. I didn't say obstetrics because then I'm locking myself in. I said women's health, which is broad, you know, and this is what I bring. You know, so Olumide did his research. Don't, when people don't respond, don't let that, don't take it as a negative experience. Just take it out. Okay, it only makes you more hungry and you will knock on more doors, you know, and look at all the things Olumide said, you know, these things you don't find written anywhere. You know, Ijama here is saying, don't downplay any experience you have. And that is so true. I think I've said it on one of my videos that, um, I worked as, um, so this was after my exam school. So people did a certification in healthcare aid course. I said, I'm not doing that. But instead, what did I do? I looked at different facilities and there was this one called home instead. And they were they actually go into people's homes, people with dementia. And I wrote a cover letter to them. I said, I'm a physician internationally trained, but I don't have geriatric experience that I would like to see geriatrics from the lens of the patients because I hope to eventually do care of the elderly as a family physician when I start working in this country. It was a story, right? But they bought my story and I got the job and I was getting paid the same amount healthcare aides who did the certification <laughs> course, you know? And during my interview, so I put it there, you won't believe that as, before I finished residency, I, one of the jobs I had waiting for me was in a long-term care facility that was the newest in Calgary. It was new, brand new. It had been opened during COVID right across from the children's hospital and the teaching hospital. And how, I didn't interview for that job. In my statement, my cover letter or whatever, I just said, I have experience with the elderly, you know, elderly with dementia. I worked with them for two years. Nobody asked in what capacity, <laughs> just seeing that, you know? So like I just said, don't downplay anything, you know? You can fine tune it. There are nice ways of putting these things, you know, to be removed, registrar and put resident. Sometimes the semantics, the grammar confuses them, you know? So look at how they're speaking it here. How are they saying it here, you know? And yeah. So thank you. So you talked about, so all of this is resume. So I think we should move faster. <laughs> I just about? want to quickly add, okay. I just want to quickly add something just to touch on one thing that you, that you said. Um, during my medical school, I COVID happened during my third and fourth year. And so I wasn't able to do any sort of clinical experience at any of these academic, academic institutions. And so, um, I had to start emailing a lot of people just to see how I could get involved, knowing fully well that I they wouldn't get a chance to see me see me work. And a lot of my post I didn't match initially, so I graduated from medical school. And all the experiences and all the opportunities I got after my after or like post graduation, none of them were through a traditional application process. All of them were through reaching out to people and um, connecting with people. Believe it or not, um, one of them was actually through Twitter. So I sent I sent a DM to one of the recently matched Canadian students saying, "Hey, unfortunately I didn't match this year, um, but I'm looking for more opportunities to to do research at U of T." And then he said, "Okay, sure, I'll keep you in mind." And two months later, lo and behold, he sent me a DM saying, hey, the person is looking, is working with, is looking for a new person um, to work with. And that relationship was very key to help me in my success this year. Also, I, I, between last year and this year, I was doing a medical innovation fellowship at Western University. And how I got that position, it wasn't through the traditional <coughs> application because the applications 
actually had already closed. When I didn't match, I was looking for things to do. I looked at the application. The application had already passed. They had already selected everyone they wanted for that cohort. But I, I had already I'd connected previously with someone I met on LinkedIn, who's actually on this call uh, as well, and messaged her saying, hey, I noticed you're doing this medical innovation fellowship at Western. I'm interested in it. And she said, okay, sure, I'll talk to my director. And that's how I was able to get the position after the application had closed. So um, just to highlight, you see, it doesn't hurt to reach out to as many people as you can. Um, the worst that can happen is that they're not going to email you back or they're going to say no. Um, and if something somewhere is going to stick, so just cast your net as wide as you can. I, I, I really have, I think we should re echo that, you know, you have to send emails out, you have to reach out you cannot stay indoors you have to when i was a medical student i think i sent nothing less than 40 emails to every school i could find just looking for an elective everyone many people didn't respond was no from other people then there was the one you know and when i landed in canada i applied or i sent emails to everyone phd fellowship anything <laughs> I was even looking into uh, simulation and just as um, Dr. Uh, and Olumia said, something will stick. So just push out those emails, push out, connect with people. In fact, there was one person I went to do an observership with in, in the United States. Um, he's a urologist, he's a Nigerian, but he did his training in uh, the United States. And I was on this Telegram group and he was showing radical prostatectomy. And I thought, how is a Nigerian able to do robotic uh, um, radical prostatectomy? So I sent him a message that, sir, are you a Nigerian? He said, yes, I'm a Nigerian. Are you the one doing this radical prostatectomy with robots? He said, yes, I'm the one. I'm like, in Nigeria? He said, no, I'm in Toledo. I said, oh, okay. Can I come for an observership with you? And he said, if you have a visa, you can come. <gasps> And I was there for two weeks and that also showed up in my resume. So, it, you know, you can reach out to people via, you know, unofficial means. Dr. Akinla reached out to me on LinkedIn and I'm here. So use all these opportunities. So you have had them, you know, these are the freshest um, incoming residents. Me, I'm now old school and is still the same message. The message has not changed, you know? So um, somebody said something to me before I came in. She said, just keep busy. I've said this in one of my videos. It doesn't matter what, you know, remain relevant in that field, you know? And we said it, if it's clinical, if it's volunteering, if it's whatever, you know? And you have a lot of people who are doing a lot of work but they don't have grants for the work. So, and you know, here is fee for service. So they're not, so they're not gonna ask you, but reach out to them. If you're in Alberta, there's a guy in U of C, you know, Department of Family Medicine, he's one in charge of clinical research. He does a lot of work with INCA. That's the Alberta International Medical Graduate Association, which now you can even be in Nigeria and be a member and be getting all the benefits of being a member. It doesn't matter anymore, you know? And that man has collaborated with many people. And there's actually someone I know who worked with him and who is a current public health resident in U of A. You know, she did a master's in the department with this man and the rest is history. You know, so you never know, just keep busy. And I know life happens, we're busy, you know, we have kids, we have to make ends meet, you know, but in the space of that time, you don't know what you've got on the inside of you until you tap into it. You'll be amazed that you would use 26 hours in a day and you still be standing strong. By the, as a black woman, they say black don't crack. By the time you wear your makeup and show up the next morning, nobody will know you didn't sleep, that you've been in one meeting in a different country, you know, but everything adds up, right? Um, so Kali, so yeah, um, Kali, I'll come back to this. I'm monitoring the chat. Um, can we just quickly hear them talk about their personal statement? Because that is very important. You know, somebody reads the first paragraph and we toss it off if it doesn't strike the chord. So um, anybody can go first. 
Okay. Um, for personal statements, I think the uh, the key word there it's personal. You know, it's something that you have to be able to. Do. You really need to be able to tell a story, and that's what I think. I think stories get people, you know, and avoid cliche, avoid what everyone else will say. I have passion, or I. I'm passionate about surgery. I'm passionate. Mm. So the first thing I would say about um, the first uh, paragraph for your personal statement is that tell a story that can maybe hook the, the, the reader. You know, for me, I think I just started talking about one elective that I started, uh, the observership I got. And I said I was walking in the rain, you know, and looking for the hospital to find doctors, so, 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 and so. And then when I saw him, I spent, you know, several weeks with him and I learned, you know, so that just kind of put them in. But it's very important to use your personal statement to highlight um, your characteristics. But in highlighting your characteristics, rather than say, I am hardworking or I am uh, I'm a team player, you give examples, you know give examples, that's the thing about North America. Nobody wants to hear those words. They just want to hear the examples. So what example of you being a team player, or, or you know, what example of you being innovative? Um, one example I kept using in all of my <laughs> personal statements and everywhere, I'm sure people were tired of hearing it was that sometime when I was um, doing, I think my second to the last year in residency, I noticed that you know it was difficult for medical students to uh, see what was happening on the operating table. So I innovated this camera that was mounted on the head of the surgeon and wirelessly um, uh, showed what the surgeon was seeing on a screen just a bit away from the table. So students can watch what the surgeon was doing without having to crowd the table and you know break uh, surgical sterility and. I put that you know, in my personal statement just to sell that, oh, I can solve problems, I can innovate, and I'm also like advocating for students and other residents. So uh, if you have concrete examples in your personal statement, that's very great. And then the last thing is to show that you have some understanding or you, you, you've done a bit of your research about that program, you know? So you can find something maybe obscure, something quite exciting about that program and put there and say, um, okay, um, the surgical training program, like for Toronto, Toronto had this surgeon scientist, uh, as this surgeon scientist training program where you can have a, a PhD or a master's while doing your residency. And you can highlight it as one of the reasons why you are you, you know, interested in their program. So it shows them that, oh, this person has, you know, knows about our program. Or uh, there was one of the programs that had this rural elective where you would go to Equalute somewhere in the northern part of Canada for a few weeks. And I said, oh, I, I look forward to going to Equalute to, you know, for rural uh, practice. And they were like, oh, this guy must have read our website so much that he saw that part where there's an elective in equal So I think those are things that are very important. And then I think the final thing is to get people to review it. I had people look through my personal statement over and over again to get it better worded. And um, don't start very late, start very early because you would need to do a lot of revisions of it. So you can start several weeks or months before the application deadline. Thank you, Toby. And um, we're unfortunately running out again. I was hoping that by 6.30 at words we'll have wrapped up. So Olumide, over to you now. Um, just in the interest of time, I don't really have much to add to what uh, Dr. Fashla had said. Uh, again, just to reiterate, show, don't tell. So don't say I'm, I'm tenacious, give an example of um, how you're tenacious and also it would be nice to to start off with a story that would reel the readers in. That's really all I have to say. Honestly, um, Dr. Fashola really hit all the points. All right. So 
I still remember the first paragraph of my personal statement. I remember how we started. So I don't know if you remember the first paragraph. Do you remember how you introduced your first paragraph? Um, so yeah, I have I have mine open here in front of me. So I started by just saying that at 16, I came to Canada from Nigeria as an international student by myself and spent about 11 years building a community here. And I had to leave, make a difficult decision to leave Canada. Um, and now I'm trying to return to Canada as an IMG to, to give back to Canada, a country that has given me so much, something along those lines. All right. Um, that was how I started. Toby, how did do you remember how you started? Uh, yeah, um, I don't have mine open, but it was in the lines of, um, you know, one of those observerships. And I'm sure the person who was reading it was like, where's this guy going? Because I said it was a raining afternoon, okay. morning or something. I, I tried to just give a description of the streets of um, Manitoba or so. Yeah, Manitoba. And I, I was looking for a particular doctor and that was the culmination of several emails back and forth, you know, to just get that observership experience. Mm. And, then I told, and then I said, okay, in that day, I was able to, you know, see what Canada's healthcare was like and all of that. And then eventually carried it on to explaining why I was, excited about giving back to Canada on my way as like coming back to Canada and then you know practicing as a surgeon so yeah <laughs> so you know this is important because the first paragraph makes or breaks that decision to invite you back we're reviewing hundreds of statements and that story power to hold your audience is important this, I've read so many generic ones. And how I started was I'm the eldest of three girls in sub-Saharan Africa, you know, and I talked about the culture of how the male child, right? But then I talked about a father who was not the prototype of an African father, you know? And I think somewhere there, I did mention that it was, um, was from a middle income family, right? So in that paragraph, is loaded with so much. So your first paragraph and your last paragraph, and my last paragraph was why it had to be here. And then that's where I went Canadian. Like I said, having spent this X time in this place, even though I have other opportunities, I cannot imagine living in any other province where I cannot wake up to the grandeur of the majestic Rocky Mountains or feel the wind blowing when I'm skiing down the slopes. I don't know how to ski. It was a story, <laughs> right? You know, like you actually believe what you've written and you're carrying your audience. So it's so important. So thank you. And so now I will end by going on to previous questions. Somebody talked about exams. Um, you've answered that question. And somebody, there was a recent one, um, I'm coming. I thought I was monitoring it. <laughs> um, Ijoma said a lot, you know, so quickly scan through what Ijoma has said. If you had a question I didn't say, you just raise your hand and unmute yourself and ask your question directly. Um, at this point, I would like to, you know, they've told you, so that last thing in our invites that said and sharing their tips, right? We've shared their tips from the onset of this meeting. We cannot overemphasize how grateful we are to two of you making time out of no time because I know the next couple of weeks prior to starting residency is a lot of pressure, you know, but um, I want to say thank you to everyone who is a participant and I would like to recognize those who are here who matched in 2022 or who are current residents. 